you may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah. It's in the first chapter of Isaiah, beginning with verse 16. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us argue it out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Friends, as we get ready to hear the invitation to communion, we'll sing this morning, Wash, O God, our sons and daughters. You may remain seated as we sing. Church. Johnny, would you turn number seven up just a bit? See if that's that's oh, maybe yeah. good. Yeah. 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 There we go. Thank you. That's better. Uh, in the United Methodist Church, uh, we have what we call open communion. All are invited to come. The only thing we ask is that you answer this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all that love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Together, friends. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In just a few minutes, I'll be inviting the ushers to come forward for the collection of our gifts and tithes and offerings. Uh, I just want you to know that we are grateful for the faithfulness of our church and the way that we're reaching out. I'll have some things to say about that during the message in a little bit. But as the ushers are ready, if you would come forward and we'll proceed with the offering. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift that you give us to participate in your kingdom. The ways we participate, not just with our presence, but with our gifts and our tithes and our offerings, where we 
work to become the church that this community needs. To live into the, the gospel as you've taught us. To reach out to those that are poor, those that are in need, those that need help beyond what they can see in front of them. So we thank you for every gift, for every tithe and every offering. And we commit with you, God, to use that for the glorification of your name in this community and throughout the whole world. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. scripture this morning comes from Genesis in the 15th chapter. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no offspring. And so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, look toward the heaven. Count the stars, if you're able to count them. Then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him his righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. These two scriptures seem to fit our world today perfectly, I think. I really like the first one in Isaiah where he says, let's argue it out. You know, I grew up at a time when we didn't have to agree. We didn't hate people just because we didn't agree with them. In fact, sometimes we enjoyed being around people we didn't agree with because we could get into great discussions. In this particular case, God is saying or inviting argument with Him. How many people think that their sins are so great that they've varied so far off the, strat the path, that they've gone so far down the wrong path that God doesn't care about them anymore. And this scripture reminds us that if you just are obedient, you will eat the fruit of the land. Now, i got to tell you, sometimes the fruit of the land is grape nuts. Or Wheaties. And sometimes it's ribeye steaks. We don't get a commitment from God which one He's going to give us. What he says is, if you're obedient, I will reward you and I will bless you and I will forgive your sins. And then Abram, he's an old guy. You know, in that day, and maybe even in today's day, he didn't have any heirs. And so he had this stuff that he had acquired. And, and he was worried that he was going to have to leave that stuff to a person that was simply a servant or a slave, not one of his heirs. Can you imagine being as old as he was and God saying, don't worry, I'm going to give you a child? Most of us wouldn't be too happy about that. Amen. But Abram wanted that person. He wanted somebody to carry his line on. I, I totally understand that. My, my little strain of the Walmart family uh, my dad had 
a brother and two sisters. I mean, one of his sisters had a boy, but of course he wasn't a Womack anymore. He was a walker. And so I was the last Womack to carry our little strain of the family on. And it made sense to me to understand that when, when my oldest son was born, my dad, he drove as fast as he could get from Houston to Beaumont to be there to see the heir of the Womack family. Now, my two boys, one of them had leukemia. He's not going to have any children. The other one has a boy. Guess what this daddy, this granddad thinks about that. I'm pretty happy about having an heir. And I know all of our grandkids are important, but he's got a particular responsibility, and I want him to grasp it, but he's nine. He hasn't got hold of that idea yet. <laughs> I remember when Buddy Gartman was a here and living with still he's going on to be with God now and, and as we did his funeral service what he always told his kids as they got ready to leave the house whatever they were going to be doing whether it was going to school or whether it was he said don't forget you're a gardener now friends we are heirs of Abram's family and so I guess the message really is for us when you get ready to go do anything, whether it's to go to work or school or play or hang out or do anything, maybe someone in a, in a head, we, in a voice in our head ought to be saying, you're a child of God. Don't forget that. We live in a tough time right now where so many times being a child of God is okay when you're around other children of God that have professed that, but going out into the world sometimes is kind of tough. I get that too. When I was in college, there was a bunch of guys carried a Bible with them to class. I didn't even carry any books, let alone a Bible. We made fun of them, called them Bible thumpers. We had some in high school too, even at Rayburn. That place that some people think is a, a den of inequity. <laughs> you know, but but. We are so quick to judge other people and forget that, that we're supposed to look at these scriptures and all of the scriptures in this book, all 66 books, through the eyes of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You see, we know that all of the stuff that went on in the Old Testament, well, it's historically correct, some of it, and it's, it's legend and it's story. But it was before Jesus came. When Jesus came, he said, I came to not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And you fulfill it by doing three things. You love your neighbor as you love yourself. You love God. You love others as I love you. And you do unto others as you'd have to do unto you. Now that's the lens through which we should see all of it. And if it doesn't agree with that, then we need to understand that, well, some of it probably needs to be taken in context. Like this scripture about Abram, we've got to take it in context. He was nearly a hundred years old. He was old. He had an old wife. He didn't see any way he was going to have children. So he's reminiscing with God. He's arguing, if you will, with God. Why am I even here? What choice do I have? My heir, my heir is going to be Eliezer. And God says, go out and look at the heavens. If you can count the stars, that's how many years are going to be. And you know what? We know it's true because look around the kingdom now. And all the people that profess Jesus Christ, there's several billion of those, and then also if we include our Jewish brothers and sisters, it's just the largest percentage of religious people on this planet. <coughs> God's prophecy came true. But it doesn't end there. It's not just biological because Jesus says, I adopt you into my family. I've chosen you to be part of the kingdom work. And therefore, we are children of God and we're supposed to have heirs in the kingdom as well. And I want to tell you, that means the people we run into, the people we see, the people we know. The reward of faith is not always instant. It's not always something you get to see. It's not always something that you're going to get to fulfill. Trust me, Abram has not seen the fruit of his labor. A few weeks ago, a guy that I know, known him for some time, actually met him in Pasadena Faith in Action way back, I think, in 2009. Uh, 
was going through some tough times. His mom was in a nursing home. She got COVID. They had transferred to a hospital. His wife was having some surgery. Things are just not looking good in his life. And, and he showed up here on a Saturday night at church. And I was glad to see him. I hadn't seen him in a long time. It was nice to visit with him. The last time I had actually seen him was at Randy Corner's service. Now I know, because I've been around a while, that typically people come back to church if they've been church folk when something happens in their life. It's not 100%. But a lot of times you'll find out, if you dig into it, that something's going on. Either it's a health thing or a family thing. And so as I visited with this young man, I, and I can call him young, uh, found out about his mother, his grandmother, his wife, his mother, not his grandmother. And he enjoyed being in a place where he could just come and kind of be around people that he really didn't know, but that were nice to him. To be closer to God as he dealt with these troubles in his life. And you may not know this, but every Saturday night we serve communion with every single worship service. <coughs> and I noticed, and I do notice things like that, that he didn't come to communion. That's not unusual. Visitors sometimes don't. Well, the next week he came back and didn't come to communion. I happened to run into him on Thursday here in town. I said, look, I am not judging you. If your particular denomination or your particular uh, affiliation suggests that you should only do communion in your church, I get that. And don't, don't feel judged by me. I'm just inviting you to let you know that in our United Methodist thinking, everyone's welcome. He said, well, I knew I was welcome, but he said, I, I have stuff in my life that, that's not all that good. I'm, I'm not really living up to that. And there is a scripture, if you want to be real literal about it, that says, don't go to the altar if you have anything against your brother. In fact, it says, go resolve it before you come. And that may be all true, but we're in the United Methodist understanding of communion, what we're inviting you to do is to come and participate in the mystery of being closer to God than you can be anywhere else on this planet and receiving what somehow in a mystery that we can't explain becomes for us the body and blood of Christ. And I said, none of us deserve it. If, if, if it was based on my inner thoughts, they wouldn't let me be here. If it was based on what I had done in my life, I wouldn't be able to be here. I don't know about y'all. I'm just worried about me. And I'm not good enough. I still say stuff I shouldn't say. I still think stuff I shouldn't think. I still act in ways I shouldn't act. I do all of that in total disobedience. But you know what? Unlike the Old Testament in Isaiah, Jesus says, I have mercy and grace and invite you to come. And I believe something magical. And I don't mean that in the weird sense of magic. Mysterious. Unbelievable. Unexplainable. Unattainable. That thing can happen when we come here. One of the greatest honors that we have as United Methodist elders is being able to bless the elements of serve Holy Communion. And right now in this world we live in, there are so many people that are, that are caught up in, in, well, I'm too far gone. I'm too far down the wrong path. I don't deserve it. Well, no, we don't deserve it. It's a gift freely given. <coughs> Free. And when we receive it, when we put our hands out and we receive it, we receive that free gift. So many times we look at the Scriptures and we forget that these things were written by human beings. I believe, let me be clear, I believe it's all divinely inspired. I believe we have the Bible God wants us to have. But we look at these scriptures and they don't make sense to us because we don't live when Abram lived. We don't live when King David lived. We don't have the context appropriate to understand what was going on. And so we look at that and say, how can I make sense of, uh, of a God that tells people to go out and, 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 and kill other people or, or a God that says you have to have a rod to, to beat your child or, 
a God that says if you want to use the bathroom, you have to have a hole outside your house. Well, in those days, that was important because they needed to get people to do biological things outside, not inside. There's a lot of lessons we learn in the Bible, but we've got to understand the context of that stuff. And we've got to look at it through the eyes of Jesus Christ. Who came and said, that stuff is important. It was important at the time. I quote, he quoted many things from Isaiah and other places, but he boiled it down to friends, love one another. Love your neighbor. Love others as I have loved you. And how much did he love us? <clears throat> he gave it all. He was obedient. To God and went to the cross. Now I know there's at least eight theories of atonement on what that really means. What I want you to know is there's a lot of ways to understand it, but it was a gift given to us by a Savior that forgave us even before we sinned. It was a gift given to us by a Savior that entered into Jerusalem knowing that His death was imminent and, in, and, and cried over what was going to happen and what has happened and what continues to happen. Now, I know that just because you come to church on Sunday or Saturday doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you've bought into everything that's in the Bible or that you understand it all perfectly. There's so many things that, that we, we don't understand. We, we don't do it on communion Sundays, but we, we say the Apostles' Creed, you know, and we say things in there about the virgin birth and all this stuff, and, and people are looking that we live in a time right now that, that science is, is, is there too, and we've got to understand the science as well as the Scriptures, and God never said turn your brain off. We're supposed to think and understand and relate to each other and to God. And maybe we forget that even historically, people doubted. <laughs> Joseph doubted the virgin birth. He was going to cast Mary aside, casually, so as not to make a bad name for her. Until he heard from an angel that God gave him different understandings. And Mary didn't totally understand it either, did she? She was curious about what was going on. And, and then we want to judge people sometimes because they doubt or they don't understand and we forget that, you know, who's the big doubter in the Bible is Thomas. It doesn't make you bad because you doubt. It, it makes you uh, amenable to hearing what the Spirit has to say to you. Sometimes we need to take the words of that Isaiah passage and we need to argue it out. I mean, really. When our 20-year-old grandson was killed in a motorcycle wreck, God didn't need another angel in heaven. His family hadn't done some great sin. It was an accident. And it didn't make sense. And you know, sometimes you just want to go shut a door somewhere and scream at God. Amen. You know what? That's okay. And I think it's about time we took the church to a place where people understood, I don't have to buy into everything you're telling me, preacher. I'm trying to search it out. I sat on, uh, I don't know, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday on the District Committee on Ministry. My particular group this time had three people that want to be United Methodist pastors they went before the District Committee on Ministry, which you have to go there before you go to the big board. They went to the District Committee on Ministry, and every one of them was told, you need to wait. You haven't quite got it down to where we understand that you understand what we're all about. Can you imagine what it would be like to go through all the work, to write the papers, to do the studies, to get to that place, and being told you're not quite ready? Now, if you know me pretty well, Sometimes I'm not the most tactful person of responding to things. And so my job was to be the leader for the first one. So this person came and sat down before us. And my question or statement and question was, well, you were here last year and told no. What's going to be different today?
And so the person looked at me for a little bit. And then the person's demeanor and affect, I, the only word I know to use is, was a surrender. And so they related the story about, well, after they were told, oh, they had one, they were disappointed, and they were sad, and they were kind of lonely, and they felt rejected, and they, they did all this stuff, and they sat there, and they kind of stewed about it. That seems normal, right? And then one day, suddenly, this person said, I felt shame. Not shame because you told me no. Shame because I wasn't talking to you from my heart. I was giving you the words I thought you wanted to hear. I wasn't all in. I was giving you what I thought you needed to know to do it. And I felt shame that I had tried to mislead you and that I was actually misleading myself. And this person's affect then turned into pure joy as they related to us. Can you believe it? I finally felt shame. Have you ever felt good about feeling shame? It was a transitional moment for that person to realize who they really were. It's one of those aha moments when you, when you, you get it. You know, I've had those moments in my Christian life. I've had them when my dad died. I had them when I've been by the, the, the deathbed of, of church members that were dying. I've been with families that were grieving the loss of a loved one. Those are the times when, uh, as Johnny would say, my calling. <laughs> when, when the opportunity I have to be there with friends and loved ones or people that I've just met in the toughest times of their life. Show me that God's right. God is good all the time. But sometimes we can't see it. So when I talk as this message is about the rewards of faith, I want to tell you that, that the reward of faith is something greater than you can put in the bank. It's not something tangible, but it's something that when you get it, you know it. When you reach out and you, you make a difference in someone's life, when you invite them to do something, when you invite them into a relationship with Jesus Christ, and, and maybe they come to your church or maybe they go to another one and you run into them sometime and they say, my life has changed. About 20 years ago, I probably have told this story before, but it fits here. Nine-year-old boy came to me after church and he said, preacher, I want to be baptized. I said, okay. Why? He said, well, I said, wait a minute. We need to have your mom in on this conversation or your dad or whoever. So can we arrange a time for you all to come and I'll meet you here and we can sit down. He said, yeah. So we talked to mom. They all came. We sat down. And I said, so uh, whatever the little boy's name was, says he, he wants to be baptized. And, and my question is, what's going on here? Now, now, this is an aside. I'm just going to move for a different story briefly because I had another nine-year-old's dad call me and say, this little girl's teacher told her if she wasn't baptized and she died, she was going to hell. You see, that's the kind of stuff that goes through my head. Why? Well, I met with that family and we got it all straight. That's, baptism doesn't save you. So he went back to this little guy. So uh, I said, well, so why do you want to be baptized? He said, well, I got this friend. He said, you know him. And he gave me his name. I said, yeah, I remember him. We baptized him last year. He said, yeah, you did. And he said, you know, he told me that after he was baptized and he took seriously his relationship with Jesus, his relationship with his mother got better. His relationship with his teachers got better. He didn't back talk his mom as much. He wanted to be different. And he felt like that, that event, that public de declaration of his faith was so powerful that he had said this up in public and he just couldn't betray it. I'm thinking, wow, I heard this good of stuff from 30 year olds. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, so if you're going to change your life, and you're going to do more good, as this scripture said, do good, resist evil. Uh, 
How are you going to know? I mean, can you define for me in nine-year-old words what's wrong? And he thought for a minute. He said, well, there's a kid on my street that has a dirt bike. And he rides it in the street. And he doesn't have any license plates on it. He doesn't have a driver's license. He said, I think that's wrong. I said, yeah, anything else? He said, and he doesn't wear a helmet either. <laughs> I said, okay. So I got this picture that, that at whatever level a nine-year-old gets right and wrong, I'm with him, okay? And so we invited him to come and be baptized. And so what anything he did, it was what his friend did that he saw, that he heard about, that changed his life. I want to tell you, friends, we know that the preachers have impact. We know that Sunday school teachers have impact, but you don't realize how much impact you have. When's the last time you told somebody your story? Remember that time? I don't know when it was for you, but there was a time when, when some of this became clearer to you. I, you don't have to have it all figured out. I certainly don't. But, but when was that time when, when that message from Jesus, that, that big bucket of stuff that, that we're going to filter everything else through became governing power of your life. You know, there was a movement, I guess, about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, what would Jesus do? It's that kind of thing. When did you start to look at everything you did in relation to whether or not Jesus would do it? Because i got to tell you, when I read some of the Old Testament, if Jesus would have been there, they wouldn't have done it that way. Jesus came to show us what it was like to be the way God wants us to be. You know, Jesus didn't spend much time in the temple trying to convert the religious people of the time. He didn't spend any time other than when he, that one time when he was 12 up there arguing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees telling them they got him wrong. They showed up sometimes and they made fun of him and, and he kind of got back at them. But he spent his time with sinners and prostitutes and people that needed to change their lives. I saw it this morning. I don't know when he said it, but Pope Francis made a statement. You know, if we're going to be Christians today, we need to be Christians, you know, that have an iPod. Or, or that meet our friends somewhere and have a beer or eat a pizza. And they relate to the world in a way that shows them what it's like for Christians to really love other people. Not to condemn. I was eating at, uh, I don't know what it was called, in. it's a Mexican food place over there on Center Street. I think it's, uh, yeah, anyway, it's still there. I think it's had different names. I was meeting with Sam Shirtliff. Some of y'all know Sam. This is, when he, this is 20 years ago. And uh, we were talking about what it was going to be like to start a new church in Pasadena. And Sam, who was an ordained Baptist preacher, had left the Baptist church where he worked because they were telling things like, you know, that 20-year-old's grandson that was killed in a, a wreck, that there was sin in their life, that there was things that went wrong in their life that caused that boy to be killed like that, and he just couldn't buy it. We had long discussions, and, and so we went to this restaurant. The only seats they had available at noon were in the bar. And he knew I was a recovering alcoholic, but we went and sat in the bar anyway. I didn't order a beer. He didn't either. So we talked for a while. And meanwhile, two of my Methodist preacher friends came in and they walked through and they got a chair back in the back somewhere else. So we got ready to leave. And you know they were serving two pretty close by churches. And so after Sam left, I went over and shook their hands and said, good to see you all today. And they said, yeah, we noticed you were sitting in the bar. And I said, yeah, I noticed you weren't. Are we going to hide from the fact that the people that are sitting out there in the world as if we aren't? They don't, we don't, we can't, we can't get, go and infect them with the love and mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. 
If we want the rewards of faith, then we have to live our faith. And Wesley said it, he had it said to him. He said, you may not have enough faith to do that today. A guy, he told one of the guys, he said, I don't feel like I have enough faith to preach it. And he told him, he said, preach faith till you get it, and then preach faith because you have it. And sometimes the reward of faith not only helps somebody else, but strengthens ours. Two thousand and one. The end of September, my dad, my mom called and said my dad had fallen. She couldn't pick him up. I got there before the EMTs, and my dad had gone on to be with God. He was laying on the floor in our bathroom. The EMTs came down the hall. They said, "You want us to try to revive him?" I said, "No." I don't know any other way to tell you this, but at that moment, all those Sunday school lessons, all those sermons that I had slept through, all those times I would read the Scriptures, all of that stuff was true for me because I knew at that moment my dad had gone to be with God. And why in the world would I want them to revive him, to bring him back for radiation and chemotherapy and pain and suffering of cancer? Amen. 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 I wish I could give everybody a moment like that. But my guess, you have more of them than you think. It's a complicated world we live in, but I want to tell you, friends, if we can just put our lenses on, our, our big glasses that say love, mercy, grace, Jesus. I've been a Methodist since I was born. Six months old. Like that. I love the Methodist church. I love the fact that we're Diverse, that we have different ideas, that we're not all uh, ubiquity, exactly the same, that we have differing thoughts, different ideas, but I love Jesus more than that. And I want to be a part of a church that loves Jesus so much that we use that as the lens for how we move forward from this day forward. Amen. Jesus' is teaching. Jesus is life. Jesus is death. And Jesus is resurrection. Hey, the morning of the resurrection, the women went to the tomb. They went back, told the guys, hey, we saw Jesus. He's risen. And they said, no, we don't believe that. Doubting is okay. Let's encourage it. Let's encourage people to question and ask. Because relationship, what Wesley called holy confidence, is where the, the, the real body of Christ shows up. Where we can share our concerns, we can love each other, and we can love those that don't even know why we would yet. Our blessing box is one way we do it. Eleven kids we sent to Champions Kids Camp, that's another way we do it. <clears throat> Sending our kids to summer camp, that's another way we do it. Well, we got to do more than that. I'm looking for rewards. Long-lasting, eternal rewards for our faith. How about you? Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, as you're able, would you please stand? Take this opportunity to offer signs of peace and reconciliation to those around you in the church.
And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is Jesus Christ who called you Abba, Father. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embrace the people as your own and fill them with a longing for a peace that would last and for a justice that would never fail. In Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory, and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you, and he broke the bread, giving it to the disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave it to the disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts, that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the whole world, redeemed by Christ's blood. As the grain and grapes, once dispersed in the fields, are now united on this table in bread and wine, so may we and all your people be gathered from every time and place into the unity of your eternal household and feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And the church says, Amen. Amen. Friends, and currently, because of COVID, I'm still doing the serving, and so I will, when you come, you're invited to come. When you come, I will uh, give you the bread already dipped into the grape juice, and you will uh, be able to uh, partake. You can go right back to your seat, or you can pray here at the altar rail if you want. Uh, you are invited to come. I think we have a few more people today, so let's start with those of you that are on your left, my right, if you all would come first. That will get A.J. up here to help us sing the songs. The songs that we're going to sing during communion, Johnny will be putting on the screen.
sing that one once more. Okay. we've been to the place where heaven and earth meet, we are yet beginning to understand the way faith moves us, changes us in this life. And normally I would say we're dismissed almost, and I'd give a little prayer, but we're not going to do that today because we have some school teachers. Carla is going to go teaching for the first time in two days, right? And Melissa is going to be teaching Right there, raise your hand, Melissa. And then Michelle is going to be working with the kids too, right? And then we know Brent's going to be there too. So uh, anybody else that's going to be working in school and teaching our kids? Well, I think we need to pray for them. Absolutely. Because they're going to be dealing with people like you and me were when we were kids. <laughs> so so it, as you will, this will also be our benediction. But let's pray for those, all of the teachers. They're going to be taking our children into the next generation of leaders as we take this year. Let's pray. Gracious God, we know that teachers have an awesome job. We know that really successful teachers are called by you to do that work. We also know, God, that unfortunately sometimes they have to raise our kids because we're too busy doing other stuff. So we ask you to give them all the grace, all the mercy, and all the love that you can so that they not only work to do their duty at the school, but they are there to transform and change the lives of these children. We trust that you will be with them every day. Keep them safe. Keep the kids interested. And keep that opportunity to learn and teach and educate alive in their spirits. God, we thank you for teachers those that we had, and those that are going to work this week. And we thank you for the students that will keep our country alive and well in the days to come as they grow both physically and mentally and spiritually over the years. It's in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, Amen. go in peace.